Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar. I hope everybody likes the cute little picture of the baby sloth. I hope it's big enough for everybody to see it. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the weekly ANA webinar. Today's webinar topic concerns native language learning in urban communities. We are featuring three ANA urban program grantees. We know from the census that the urban native population is growing. Preserving native culture and languages can be challenging in an urban setting. Native people may not be centrally located. There could be a lack of personal or municipal transportation available. For, um, a variety of tribes or um, native communities could be represented. Um, or even finding first or second language speakers could be difficult. Our presenters today will talk about the challenges in not only conducting, but also planning urban native language classes. As I mentioned, ANA hosts weekly webinars on a variety of topics. The Administration for Native Americans is a program located within the Department of Health and Human Services under the Administration for Children and Families. ANA serves all Native Americans, including federally recognized tribes, American Indian and Alaska Native organizations, Native Hawaiian organizations, and Native populations throughout the Pacific Basin. ANA promotes self-sufficiency for Native Americans by providing discretionary grant funding for community-based projects and training and technical assistance to eligible tribes and Native organizations in three program areas. Social and Economic Development Strategies, or SEDS, Native Languages, and Environmental Regulatory Enhancement. You can find much more information concerning ANA on their website at www.acf.hhs.gov slash ANA. My name is Rondell Clay. I am the Regional Director for the Eastern Region Training and Technical Assistance Center, a resource of the Administration for Native Americans. I am a member of the system Wapitinoyate. I have been an ANA TNTA provider for um, 14 years, since 2000. Prior to that, I worked for the Seminole Tribe of Florida as an educator, both in early childhood education as well as elementary education. We are going to start off with our first presenter, who is from Alaska. Val Clark has worked in nonprofits since 1996 and grant writing and administration since 1999. She has a BA from the University of Alaska Anchorage and an MFA from Old Dominion University. Currently, she's the grants administrator for the Alaska Native Heritage Center which is dedicated to preserving and strengthening the traditions, languages, and arts of Alaska's Native people. Val, I'll turn it over to you. OK, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. Um, hello, everybody. OK, so our first slide it up is up, which is basically just a way for me to show off the different languages that we have. Um, please don't ask me to pronounce any of those, but they're all basically saying hello. Um, we got a grant project awarded in 2012. It was a one-year grant project, and the name of the project was Revitalizing Indigenous Languages for Urban Alaska Natives. You can go to the next slide. This was our problem statement. Um, there were only two or three, there still are only two or three Alaska Native languages that are sort of maintaining themselves, uh, especially in urban settings in Alaska. Rural villages here are much better at it, um, but as Rondell mentioned, migration into urban centers is just increasing exponentially. 
Um, a lot of people are looking for jobs, medical support, education, whatnot, and they're not leaving town or they're moving in with their kids. Uh, and so uh, when you move into an urban setting, very often your choice is to leave behind your language if you want to get along with, with everything else that's going on. And so we're experiencing massive language loss in Alaska. Um, UNESCO, there's 20 recognized Alaska native languages. They're linguistically distinct. Um, and they're all some level of endangered, according to UNESCO. And we have one language, EAC, um, which is considered extinct. Um, there's one somewhat fluent speaker of EAC, and he's a French student who's dedicated to reviving the language. Uh, and that particular community is actually relying on him to help them right now, because the level of fluency in EAC is non-existent. We um, became aware um, that there was a sharp decline in fluency levels when the um, Alaska Native Language Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks put out a chart that showed the really sharp decline in language fluency among all 20 languages uh, a few years ago. And our mission specifically states that one of the things that we are dedicated to um, revitalizing and maintaining uh, is language. So we decided to put work into what basically amounts to a needs assessment, uh, including a sort of a cataloging of what the current uh, resources available in Alaska are. As you all know, that when you're familiar with these grants, you get three objectives. Um, our first objective was to identify and assess local and statewide language preservation resources. Um, a lot of locals where the services were, or educators, especially at the universities. We have a pretty large university system uh, in Alaska. Knew about groups, or camps, or immersion, um, or language nests, but the marketing was very localized or non-existent. And we were especially interested in resources that could be accessed via phone or on the web. We needed to do an assessment of fluency levels, especially within the urban center um, where we are located. Uh, and so we put out a survey, a rather in-depth survey, that asked people to self-assess their language skills. Um, before we asked anybody to be a teacher, they would, of course, have to, have to take some sort of standardized um, formal assessment that we would then also use at the end of whatever the project was uh, to do program evaluation. The conference that we put together, we felt, was extremely important. Um, there's a lot of language academic conferences. Scholars get together. Um, linguists get together. But there are a lot of opportunities for um, just folks in the community to come out and talk about what their concerns are, um, what they would like to do, and basically make their voices heard about what they see the current problems as being. Prior to the grant application, we actually did very little community involvement, which, as you're all aware, is usually a big no-no. You know, get as much community involvement as you can so that you can show that the community supports your application. Um, but we didn't have a lot of resources, both personnel and financial, in order to organize what would undoubtedly be large community meetings prior, prior to the application. Um, the size of the community is somewhat daunting. And the sheer number of languages, if we've got 20 languages um, that we are looking at revitalizing, do we have everybody show up in a group? Do we target each language separately? You know, what do we do with that situation? So we just decided to plunge in and write community involvement into the application itself. Once we got the grant, and it was a very, very nice thing, it was only a one-year grant, of course, um, but uh, the decisions um, that year were a little late. So we had three new positions we were going to be hiring, and we weren't able to hire them until we were absolutely sure that we were going to get money. And so we were behind both in spending and in activities by the time um, we got the grant uh, award decision made. Um, this is also just an excuse for me to put up this map that shows the size of Alaska as compared to the size of the United States, just because I think it's an awesome map. But um, as you can see, we're fairly large. The state is fairly sparsely populated, but 
they're not all located in a couple of urban centers. They're everywhere. So if our staff need to communicate with somebody in Barrow, that's a really expensive flight. I can fly to the lower 48 usually cheaper than I can fly to Barrow. So we have a lot of expenses and communication becomes a, a problem. And this goes along with the next slide too. And that a lot of rural areas don't have phones, much less internet access. So if a community identifies one particular, you know, a very fluent speaker and they're one of the last people that's left and we would like to be able to use that person as a, as a resource in the program, um, the, the cost of, of that is a little prohibitive. Conference was a success, undoubtedly, but what we didn't really expect was um, the extreme depth of passion that there was. We knew people were going to be passionate, but with that many languages represented and um, so many different thought processes and the historical trauma that's associated with it, um, we had people you know, getting into arguments or who wouldn't yield after they had made comments to other people who wanted to, to respond in, in areas. So um, if we were going to do that again, we would use our past experience as well as talking to some folks about how to manage a potential powder keg like that. The um, language resources that we found, uh, it was really hard to put everything on an equal footing because sometimes it's just one person with a small language circle. Um, sometimes it's somebody who's developing an application that can be put on an iPhone that will teach you a language. And um, I have a friend who calls programs in Alaska Christmas lights. They'll go on and then they'll go off when somebody um, has an illness or has to move out of state or just gets tired of doing the project. So there's no real consistency, especially if it's outside of the university system. So this is what we learned going into our next applications. We put in an application last year that was not successful. And basically, it was because it was too big. It was unachievable. We still wanted to make everybody happy by focusing on something that would give all 20 languages a shot at the same time. It's admirable, but potentially undoable, especially with the available resources. Um, and it's because we didn't want to upset anybody. But we went back to our survey and we decided to focus on the two languages that got the most interest and also had the most current fluent speakers to, that we could train as teachers, and that's Yupik and Anubiak. Um, we are putting more focus on technology because a lot of people were interested in um, DVDs or um, something they can access on the internet or some sort of recording. Um, rather than being able to, like, say, take off work and go to a class that's not at a time that works or they don't have daycare, um, or it's a class that's solely geared towards children. So we've, we've worked more technology into it. And uh, in keeping with the, the slide after this as well, we have discovered a huge benefit um, by hooking up and making partnerships with uh, local organizations who also have an investment in language, and for us that's uh, the Alaska Regional Corporations. So we have two or three Alaska Regional Corporations who are giving us funds to um, have classes in one specific language or hire a teacher or have a, a week-long immersion camp in, in a couple of different places around the state. And one of those is going into the second year, so we have high hopes that we'll be able to um, recruit some more partners and really maximize our funding in that way. And I'd also like to stress that <clears throat> even if you don't get an ANA grant or you know something to continue what you're, what you're doing, if somebody else is interested and you can use your facility for their groups and they have resources to provide that training, it's still mission-based and it's still very important to the community. So we're lucky in that we have a very large gathering place that people can come to and we are happy to make that available to folks. And that's it. I muted myself. That's how I get to meet everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Valerie. That was a very interesting presentation. 
Now we're going to move on to a current grantee. And I'm afraid my Samoan is non-existent, so I will not pronounce anything correctly. Um, we have two presenters, Alyssa Petta, Tuupo, Ali Maleta. Uh, she was born and raised in American Samoa. She is a wife and a mother of four children who have been born and raised in Honolulu. Her husband is a retired wounded Afghan war vet. She was um, she is the director and founder of the first Samoan language center located in Hawaii, Lafet Tuau, serving Hawaii-born Samoan youth on the island of Oahu. Lafet Tuau is a grassroots development run by community members and serving preschoolers to adults. Along with her is Dr. John Mayer, who is an associate professor of Samoan as well as the chair of the Department of Indo-Pacific Languages and Literature at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He was a Peace Corps volunteer and trained and trainer in Samoa from 1970 to 1976. He holds two chiefly titles, and I won't even try to pronounce um, both of those titles from two different communities in Samoa. And he founded the Samoan language program at the University of Hawaii in 1976. He holds an MA in English as a second language and a PhD in linguistics. And he is a charter member of the International Samoan Language Commission, which was formed in 2000. Elisabetta and John, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Randa. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Good morning from Hawaii. It's uh, beautiful blue skies. I can hear the surf breaking in the distance. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm locked up in an office here talking to you guys. Um, I'm going to just briefly describe some of the demographics for the Samoan community in Hawaii and then turn it over to Elisabetta to talk more in detail about the program. Um, we also have uh, listening in and um, perhaps uh, contributing later, Rosia Savita Curry, who uh, is an important member of the program. Uh, and um, she's listening in, I believe, from Washington, D.C. Fetuau, uh, Le, Le Fetuau, um, the name means morning star. Uh, it's a reference to the planet Venus, and it symbolizes the promise of a new dawn or the beginning of a new day. Uh, the program started six years ago, all volunteer, and this year we received a three-year ANA grant uh, to provide standardized materials, training for teachers, and to produce an exportable uh, module for other Samoan communities in Hawaii and California and, and possibly even uh, other states as well. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Our location is very, very central uh, to the urban core of Honolulu, the population of which is about 800,000 people. Uh, it's centrally located to all of the Samoan population centers, which I will show you in the next slide in just a second. It has convenient freeway access to people. Um, it's a secular program, but it started uh, in the Methodist Church, and we, we quickly realized that um, there were so many people interested that, that we became a, a, a program that was open to uh, anyone. We, we do use a um, large church community center, Island Family Christian Church, which was made available to us uh, through a partnership. Uh, next slide, please. The Samoan population in Hawaii is basically centered on the, the island of Oahu, which is the main populated island in uh, Hawaii. So you can see the uh, dark areas indicate Samoan population. Uh, the north part is uh, primarily uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, Mormon uh, church community, and then the, uh, the, the western and the centrally located populations uh, are population centers of Samoan uh, people who came in primarily through the uh, United States Navy when the naval base uh, closed down in the 1950s, and later uh, larger population 
migrations in the 1970s when uh, airport expansion in American Samoa and Western Samoa was completed. There are approximately 37,000 Samoan and part Samoans in Hawaii, about a third of which come from American Samoa, which is a U.S. territory, a third from independent Samoa, and a third of local-born or California um, uh, migrants. Next, next slide, please. We serve um, a single language. Samoan is uh, spoken pretty much as the same language throughout the Samoan islands. It was, uh, the islands were divided politically in 1900. Uh, they had nothing to do with Samoan history or Samoan culture or linguistics. Um, our, our mission is to serve the Samoan community through language, culture, and literacy instruction. We serve uh, youth, parents, uh, immigrants, local borns, and people of non-Samoan heritage because we, we are very interested in also bridging uh, understanding of Samoan culture and language with the non-Samoan community. So our, our mission is not only to serve the Samoan community, but to present the Samoan culture and language to the uh, Hawaiian community at large. So we do have a number of non-Samoans who are also attending. Next slide, please. Status of the Samoan language is becoming a concern in the Samoan communities abroad. There are large Samoan communities, usually centered around areas of um, military uh, uh, bases, such as uh, San Diego, San Francisco, Oakland, Honolulu, uh, because of the high uh, participation of Samoans in the United States military. I believe Samoa has one of the highest percentage of any uh, ethnic communities in the United States. So we have, we have noticed over the last two decades a strong shift in the communities abroad, and especially uh, in, in American Samoa, actually, um, from Samoan to English by Samoan youth. And these youth, as they become older, uh, begin to exhibit cultural alienation. They don't have the same interest as their parents, especially here in communities abroad. And they begin to develop a sort of a hybrid Samoan identity in which they don't speak the language very well. They consider themselves Samoan, but they don't feel that they have the full identity uh, because they don't really have enough language to, to participate in traditional activities. The Samoan migration patterns is, is, is very circular. Um, people come up, they go back to Samoa, they come up again, they move to California, they move uh, to New Zealand, they come back. So there's a circular pattern, pattern of migration rather than a one-way pattern whereby people come into a community and they just uh, pick up residence and over a period of time begin to lose their language because there's a continual migration of adults from Samoa and from other Samoan communities. The language is virtually kept alive in the adult community, but it's becoming uh, less and less used by the youth because their language their, of primary importance, of course, is English in the school and, and with their peers. Until recently, Samoan was only taught at the university level and only here at the University of Hawaii. Within the last five years, two local high schools have developed Samoan language programs. However, there's no community venue for youth to learn the Samoan language and culture. Um, we have a tradition here in Hawaii of Japanese language schools in the community, Chinese language schools, and Korean language schools in the community that help those communities perpetuate their languages. There's never been anything like that for the Samoan language and for other ethnic uh, languages here, like, for example, the Filipino languages like Ilocano. So uh, because there's no uh, venue for uh, Samoan youth to, to learn the language, uh, we decided uh, about six years ago to put together a program utilizing expertise of community members and our program here at the University of Hawaii to develop a program as a, as a model that would then be copied by other Samoan church communities here in uh, Hawaii and in California. Because there are virtually no Samoan uh, language teachers trained to teach Samoan, it's not a commonly taught language even in Samoa, we were faced with the difficulty of uh, getting Samoan teachers to help us with our project. So part of our component in our project is teacher training. Also, uh, the unavailability of Samoan teaching materials, being that it's not a language that was uh, frequently taught, um, we have to create a lot of our own materials. Fortunately, we've been able to partnership with New Zealand, which has a very, very large Samoan community, and for the last 20 years they've been doing these types of activities themselves. Next slide, please. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to turn it over to Elispeta. And I do want to say that 
uh, in these types of community programs, in order for it to be successful, you need at least one dedicated individual who will lead and nurture a project and encourage others to get involved. And for us, this has been PEPTA. Uh, this was um, something that she had a dream about and was, uh, through her um, diligence and, and, and perseverance, was able to bring partners together. So I'm going to turn it over to PEPTA now. Thank you. Hello, for, uh, the Lepetu All Samoan Language Center is committed to building strong families by serving um, to bridge the cultural generational gap between Samoan parents and youth in the broader society in which they live. So our mission is to increase literacy in the Samoan language for our youth and understand the Samoan culture to build a, a Samoan identity and also to serve as a model for other Samoan organizations and church communities. So our mission resonates our commitment to language preservation and maintenance. Next slide. The vision. We empower from within, and the process of inner self starts from us, the people, the core existence of our language and our culture. Our vision states to empower our youth to be productive and contributing citizens with a strong self-image and knowledge of their Samoan heritage. Next slide. Our mission and vision is significant, therefore, like the name of the Aonga Samoa or the Samoan School, Fituau, which was explained before literally means bright star. Our philosophy stems from an outreach perspective, community-based approaches. The rays of the morning star, which is Fituau, must must reach all cornerstones of the child's development. Therefore, we look at education and and learning. Um, language is learned through family and community activities. Um, in traditional schools, are, is viewed to learn English only and gain education and find a job. Everything is conducted in English. Uh, so there's an assumption in our community that children will continue to learn someone in home and the community. We later realized that generation born in, in Hawaii are not speaking Samoan. So as a community, we have a desire to have someone taught in the schools, although there is DOE resistance. Um, so we developed this concept to try and re-involve Samoan churches in Samoan, you know, to teach Samoan language. Next slide. Okay, in the urban communities, how do we develop um, language programs that are successful? In our project, we have a strong school and family connection. Um, it's an effective approach to urban language development. So building a strong mutual community network and partnerships that you know, people are passionate and dedicated to the mission and vision of the program. Um, our activities are built around strong family-oriented approaches. We empower the parents to be involved as leaders and as volunteers. Um, the Samoan church communities here in Hawaii are, are new urban villages. You know, this, and Samoa is an oral language. Being that it was an oral language, knowledge was transferred from one generation to another within families and communities. So an elder would advise us and say, Etalalasi Samoa, meaning there is not one version to a story. Therefore, it's important for us as program developers to be open-minded and respect other stories in sharing, sharing and learning. With respectful relationships carried with humbleness and respect in our culture, we adhere to those important aspects to get the buy-in to empower our learners of the language. So um, even in our community, in our project, we learned that we don't just collaborate as partners or networkers, but we communicate with each other. We try to build a mutual relationship between everyone involved in the project. There's close to 70 Samoan churches on island here in Hawaii. And you know, the population of, of, of Samoans living in Hawaii based on the census of twenty of you know, two thousand and ten is about thirty eight to forty thousand, you know, thirty eight thousand people, but right now it's two thousand fourteen, of course you, you know, that number increased. Um, so the role of the church is very important in learning the language. Not only it provides the spiritual and moral teaching we can also um, incorporate education with literacy. Um, you know, we use it to, to facilitate traditional cultural practices. It's a venue for Samoan language use, 
um, youth tend to have positive social interaction. And this is where we find our fluent Samoan speakers, uh, where we find our teachers to teach the language. So the role of the Samoan church in, in, in Hawaii is very important. Next slide. What are some, of success, some successful practices we use? Hands-on approaches is, you know, is very important because it, you know, we see that knowledge is retained through um, hands-on activities. So there, we do a lot of demonstration field trips where we take our learners to practice or um, you know apply what we, what was learned in the classroom. So we do have community-based instructors. We incorporate a lot of dialogue um, activities, take-home activities, parent involvement. Um, we develop resources and you know within our staff and teachers, and we make them available to our learners. We create a safe learning environment where learners feel comfortable and you know they feel safe when they make mistakes. They're not being um, you know teased upon. We establish a fun, interactive learning environment in our projects, and you know we structure the learning activities according to cultural practices and festivities. For example, every time in the morning we come in as an uh, like in an assembly. Which is, you know, when we refer to the Samoan village, it's we call it the fono, a gathering place where everyone should come together and be ready to do, you know, do a task. Uh, we provide dialogue according to traditional settings, and these things are meaningful and functional approaches to learning the language, which is makes it more meaningful, and um, you know, people will be able to retain that knowledge. Okay, we serve preschool all the way to adult level. So we have all different classes. Um, you know, the literacy instruction is a strong component. The strong component that we include includes reading, writing, and speaking. Um, the three-year grant is working to accomplish three objectives. The first is to develop a formalized culturally based on one language curriculum and evaluation tools. Once developed, the curriculum will encompass teacher manuals, and student worksheets for a full semester of Samoan language instruction, beginning with with um, rudimentary skills, including the Samoan alphabet. By the end of the project, we hope to disseminate the curriculum to 20 teachers. But uh, the second objective of the grant that was proposed, we hope to have increased the Samoan language capabilities and fluencies of, of 30 instructional staff. Um, um, and also community-based sites as demonstrated through successful completion of trainings in years two and three and certification of 30 teachers in Samoan language instruction. As part of the final objective, Lefetua will have expanded Samoan language education to include three other community-based sites. These sites will engage 500 plus children and you know 20 parent and community volunteers in the study of Samoan language by the end of the project. What are the funding sources? Well, we only have the, you know, our ANA project under language preservation and maintenance. And we're very fortunate to have this opportunity to uh, provide more for our community. In 2008-2009, we only operated in the $10,000 project um, budget. Um, beyond those years, Project operated with no funding at all. Everything was volunteer basis. So, but we have a strong professional community and family volunteer component, and that is um, the mana, which is you know the spirit of, of of providing this service for the Samoan community living here in Hawaii. The sustainability plan is such an important um, aspect of any. Um, um, grant funded project and sustainability has to be um, you know discussed way in the beginning so as you, as you can see that we've listed some of the activities that we have we develop a sustainability team in the com in the community uh, we try to find you know more support for funding um, you know one of the things that we learn from community based implementation is we try to walk the walk and talk the talk so Instead of us, you know, developing more partners and, and, and networks, we try to collaborate and communicate. 
as a community-based project. The families and community involvement is the core existence of Le Fitzwal Samoan Language Center, and I can say it's the life of what we do. So it's very important for us to continue and um, you know, make sure that we do have support uh, from our community. It was developed for the community, by the community, and for the community in general. Thank you very much, Fasai Lava, for listening in. All right, moving on. Our next presenter is from the Native American Community Services of Erie and Niagara Counties. Rachatni Prinup is a Tuscarora of the Turtle Clan. He's currently the Director of Community and Cultural Services at NACS in Buffalo, New York. As Director, he is responsible for the oversight and coordination of a Mohawk language adult immersion program, a Native Elders program, and projects designed to maintain and strengthen indigenous languages and traditional teachings. Rachatni is the co-producer of the documentary Unseen Tears, The Impact of Native American Residential Boarding Schools in Western New York. He has provided numerous presentations and trainings throughout the area focusing on Native issues and causes as a lifelong learner of HUD Haudenosaunee history and culture. He is a vocal Native advocate as he continues to encourage Native communities to hold on to their traditional teachings and traditions. Rachatni, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good afternoon. That's hello my friends in Tuscarora. I'm actually a Tuscarora Native. Um, I live in a, a community about a half an hour uh, from Buffalo. It's the uh, Tuscarora uh, Nation uh, near Niagara Falls, New York. But I, I commute into Buffalo every day and work out of the Native Center here. Uh, we begin, uh, well, this project, Yunkiana Dunas, they show us the path uh, language project has been uh, something that really began in um, prior to 2005. Um, you can go to the next slide. We, uh, Buffalo sits uh, right between the Great Lakes there, and you see the traditional names there of um, the different, there's six, there's actually six different uh, Iroquois nations here in uh, upstate New York and Ontario, and you have the, um, starting from east to west, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cugas, Senecas, and Tuscaroras, and uh, they make up the predominant population, as you'll see on uh, the next slide here. Well, you can see here where Buffalo sits. Um, uh, Buffalo is um, one of the urban centers that a lot of Iroquois migrated to um, for, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes it was for financial reasons. Um, as we'll see in the next slide, um, the boarding schools was a huge impact on the Iroquois Confederacy here. Uh, we had over 2,000 children that went to Carlisle Boarding School alone, which was the first, one of the first uh, federal boarding schools, which is um, just a short distance from us down in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I just threw up some statistics there because um, there's a direct correlation between the boarding schools and public schools and the decline of uh, native languages across North America. Uh, and um, I think it's something not talked about enough in the United States, but in Canada it's been much more, um, much more, um, I guess, communicated. I don't know about dealt with, but there's just a little bit more awareness there. Um, so the residential schools, um, like I was saying, uh, we did have people that would move into the urban area trying to escape the residential schools, but we also found that um, urban natives were also being sent to residential schools. And um, so the loss of this um, 
kind of traditional economy contributed to the language loss. Um, so we did a, when we did um, our surveys here in um, in the Buffalo and Niagara Falls area, uh, we realized that there was at least a 99% loss of language fluency over the past uh, 50 years here in um, here in the urban area. And so this gives gives you some of the the census. Um, there were over 14,000 um, natives in the last census, 2010 census, that reported being uh, being native or of native descent uh, here in uh, Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Um, in our own surveys, uh, and we know that number is low because a lot of Iroquois won't participate in the census. Uh, we have a real strong traditional um, political structure and uh, ceremonial structure still in our area, so there's a resistance there. But we found that um, the Mohawks here in Buffalo and Niagara Falls were about 30 to 35 percent. The next largest one, well, the Senecas, this is actually uh, their territory where we're in. They were also around 30 to 35 percent. And then Tuscarora, because there's a community close by, was 13 percent. And then the other three nations, Cayuga, Onondaga, and Oneida, were all less than 10 percent. But as you can see by the numbers, um, the Mohawks having 35,000 total population estimation still had over 3,000 speakers. There were two local fluent speakers still in the Buffalo area. Uh, the Senecas, even though they had a large population of 15,000, are, are down to 15 fluent speakers. Uh, again, these are estimates. Uh, and there is one local fluent speaker here in the urban area. Tuscarora, there's around 1,200 Tuscaroras. Um, and um, there's about, that's, um, that number is incorrect there. I think there's about seven or eight speakers right now in Tuscarora, but none in the urban area. Uh, the Cugas, 10,000 population, 60 to 70 speakers. Onondaga, 1,200 population, they're about at 13 speakers. And the Oneidas have 34,000, and they're down, there you have about 160 speakers. So this was, uh, you know, some of the um, information we got from doing our uh, research. You can go to the next slide. Oh, maybe you'll have to hit a few. Uh, didn't realize that uh, they came out this way. <laughs> Those are actually our traditional Gastoa headdresses that uh, make, uh, you know, you can tell which nation they're from by how many feathers they have. Um, why did we create the program? Um, well, like I was saying, our first uh, one-year assessment grant was in 2005-2006, and it, and it showed the alarming rate of language loss um, in the urban area and in within the communities. And um, We've seen that the community had indicated uh, that language learning was important for them. And, and next, also uh, Native American Community Services um, wished to incorporate language learning um, into their agency-wide approach to health and wellness. You know, we certainly believe that um, cultural survival and language survival also translate into community health. Um, so we wanted to encourage that um, maintenance and recovery of our original languages. You can go to the next slide. So these were some of the surveys we did over the years. Um, every couple of years we'll, we'll survey the community and see where our community is, is at. And um, you know, consistently language and culture rank really high within our community of wanting both and seeing that as being very important. Uh, we did an extensive community import, in, impact uh, input survey back in 2010-2011, um, and both language and culture ranked in the top four out of about 20 different issues facing the urban community and levels of importance. And uh, that really showed a strong message of what our community wants. We also seen that 96.6% of our community members had the knowledge of only a few words. And um, what we found was um, language, um, extensive language teaching had stopped in our Buffalo and Niagara Falls public schools. They still, still do have programs there, but they're limited. So a lot of our community um, doesn't get exposed to uh, language in the urban area. So what challenges did we face? We had very few first language fluent speakers left. And those 
who did remain were not accustomed to teaching. Uh, we serve a community with six threatened languages. How do we choose one to put limited resources into? Our funding is limited and time bound, and so we, under, we understood the task of language recovery is to be a long-term one. And our community of learners face serious emotional obstacles uh, dealing with um, intergenerational trauma and a lot of those that a lot of our community members can find themselves in crisis just in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so we assessed the languages in 2005 and 6, and um, we also had a planning grant in 2009 and 2011 where we determined that we needed a more aggressive approach to language recovery. Um, we consulted with, an, with the urban community. Uh, we, we developed the language advisory committee. We went around and, and went to different language programs throughout. Haudenosaunee is really people of the longhouse. That's what the Iroquois call themselves. Um, but Haudenosaunee Confederacy and looked at the different language programs going on in our different communities. And what we really found was a very successful program going on in Grand River, Ontario. It was a Mohawk language immersion program, and it could take uh, students that had little or no language. Uh, they take an admissions test, and after, um, after two years in the program, they would be able to converse with a fluent speaker, certainly at a beginning, beginner level, and um, sometimes even more advanced. And so, um, because of the level of success, having graduated over 100 students there, we decided to model ourselves after this program that fit the demographics of what we have here, having community members that uh, had very little language exposure. And we really didn't really want to invent the, reinvent the wheel. We were very fortunate to have this. Uh, and um, they use what we call a root word method, where um, we have a lot of prefixes and suffixes. It's a polysynthetic language. And so you learn the roots, and then you can learn the prefixes and, and suffixes, and um, actually gain a lot of vocabulary very quickly. Um, so what strategies worked? Um, we focused on Mohawk again um, for a couple, for several different reasons. Um, over 3,000 fluent speakers, we realized that um, the other the other languages were more stressed for teachers within their own communities. Their communities were using a lot of the resources they had, and we didn't want to draw resources away from a community that was already struggling. And Mohawk, having that many speakers um, and materials available, gave us the most opportunity for success of reintroducing language um, in another community. Um, we also knew that the Senecas, being close by, um, were also pursuing a and and we didn't want to interfere with their efforts as well. Um, we partnered with some other agencies, I mean with other groups, to provide an authentic evening class here. And we're in the process now of, of working with Bus State to um, partner with them to provide Cayuga. Um, we found that we really had to focus on Mohawk. Um, we did offer, we offer an evening class in Mohawk also, and um, the library which you see there, which uh, we incorporate resources for all the six languages. So it kind of goes in steps where you have your own self-paced that you can do for all the six. You can um, do language classes here um, in the urban area for, for Mohawk, at least. And then uh, the immersion program is much more intensive. Our outreach efforts were really, uh, we uh, put a lot on, on listservs. We go to a lot of events here in the urban area, um, traditional social dances that we have. and um, any other speaking events here. Our funding has really been primarily a and We've gotten um, a lot of in-kind from within our agency. We actually have 32 different grants running programs here at NACS in a variety of different um, programs. And so we, we leverage those also to um, help us to provide a, a more comprehensive program. This was our language and cultural resource library, which we didn't have prior to a and and we've just continued to develop it. This is our third a and grant right now, where we have a three-year immersion program right now. And, um, but the library has been something the community could do and, and access and use um, in a self-paced option. So we know that self-paced is, um, 
It's something we offer, um, and it does help students to gain vocabulary lists, but it really doesn't create speakers. Um, you really need the interaction with teachers and other learners, um, which is crucial for fluency retention. We also found that um, students will take the path of least resistance if you give it to them. In general, most learners require a strong, structured curriculum in order to progress in fluency. Um, setting goals encourages commitment. So our, our curriculum is very structured. They have to take tests for each module, and they're all, um, they're all verbal tests, listening and talking, um, uh, having to either translate what was said to them or speak to them in English, and they translate back into uh, Ganyangeha or Mohawk. Um, some of the other strategies that um, we um, learned from in our research was um, not to underpay our teachers, especially when we're recruiting them to come into an urban area from their own communities. And so we really um, worked hard to offer a competitive salary so we could attract a good teacher that would relocate. And we also um, seen that the programs that were really um, producing um, students were, um, were paying them stipends. And so we, um, we pay students stipends to go to our uh, immersion program. And uh, it allows them to have um, help the program succeed by them not having to work an outside job with a lot of hours to try to be in the class. Um, so we don't really, um, if you don't offer them some kind of living wage stipend, it's very hard for them to commit the time and energy required to become new speakers. Um, next slide. Um, how can we keep it going? Um, the immersion program just really re represents the beginning of becoming a speaker, not the end. We have to provide our fine language employment opportunities for our graduates. We want them to continue learning and to teach others. Funding is, is uh, you know, our vision is, is to really, we had to create um, students that had the language first before we could really start implementing language at a, a focused level. So our next step really is to start looking at creating immersion daycare and or Head Start, um, develop grants where teachers, um, where we can uh, develop uh, graduates into teachers to allow us to continue the immersion and offer evening classes. Certainly partnering with other agencies uh, and partnering with other agency programs um, when we write grants to allow more language content via our programs aimed at youth, children, adults, and elders. And um, we're also seeking uh, and exploring possibility of getting our programs accredited through area colleges and universities, um, allowing students to be able to come here um, more freely. Also, it, it, it's more attractive to funders, too, if they know that the programs are accredited. Um, this was our first class of graduates. Um, two of our students actually graduated with uh, intermediate high, which was one step below between a master speaker. and so. Some students will really have that ability to learn quickly, and the, and the pace that we move really allows them to learn quickly if they have that capacity. And so um, we were really happy about that. All the students that started were able to complete and graduate from the program, and so uh, we've been really pleased. We have our second class now going. We have seven students in our next class that are currently in our second immersion class. Our immersion classes go 30 hours a week. They're actually um, six hours a day for between eight and nine months. So it's a very intense program. So this was, I uh, just wanted to acknowledge one of our um, Language Advisory Council members that passed away in 2013. Um, it was the late Warren Skye, who was a part of our Language Advisory Council. And he worked tirelessly to help the Seneca language to continue to be spoken. He was also available to help anyone needing his help, as he did with NACS, uh, Yumkiana Donuts Language uh, Project. And so he was a real inspiration to us, and, uh, and we have others too, but I, I wanted to acknowledge him. And, um, I think that was uh, the last slide. So, Nyawagoa, Eskunge, Bare. So, thank you very much. We'll see you, see you all again. Thank you, Rachetni. You're welcome. Okay, just to bring to your attention, um, ANA hosts the weekly webinars. Um, every Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on June 5th, using social media in your project is the next webinar. And if you go to the link that is on the um, screen there, 
the registration page should be up shortly. We're going to open it up for questions. If you can stay, um, we'd like to, um, to have you ask questions. If you have a microphone on your laptop and it is working, um, you can raise your hand using the little hand feature on your control panel, or you can type your questions into the question box. Either way. But while we are taking questions, um, I just wanted to tell you about the ANA Google Plus native language community. Um, please join the community if you can. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of good discussions that are going on. And just so that you can get in touch with, uh, of any, with any questions that you may think of after the presentation, um, we have the email for each of our presenters today. So I don't see any questions coming up in the box. OK, we do have, let's see, Dessa? Yes? You have a question? Yes, I was wondering on the courses that are taught in the public schools. Are they offered for high school graduation credit? Is that for the SOM 1 program? For any of the programs that were represented today? Uh, for the SOM 1 program, the, the Department of Education in the state of Hawaii approved SOM 1 language and um, Ilocano, which is a Filipino language, as the two new heritage languages that do count for credit for a world language study. Um, we try to encourage the students in the high school to uh, complete two years of Samoan language so that when they transfer to the University of Hawaii, they can use uh, that, those uh, skills to start uh, at an upper level of Samoan when they, when they undertake the foreign language requirement for the University of Hawaii's undergraduate degree. Okay. Here in then the in the order order there are um, several communities that do have um, high school accredited language programs. Um, uh -huh. I don't believe right now in Buffalo or the Buffalo Public or Niagara Falls Public that they're offering them. The reason I pose the question is that in Oklahoma we do have several Native American languages that are being taught in the public schools, but we could only offer them for elective credit unless we had a way for the teachers to be highly qualified. And in order to be highly qualified, there had to be a certification. And we recently were able to provide an alternative pathway for certification and recognize the tribe's authority to determine the proficiency level for instructors. We're very pleased to do that. And we are working now on creating even more of the, those programs and that's why I was wondering if any of the other programs had had that same hindrance. Yes, we, we have had that problem here in the state of Hawaii. We've tried for 30 years, 35 years, to have some of our heritage languages offered in the schools alongside of French, Spanish, uh, and, and of course Hawaiian. Um, and that always came up, well, the teachers aren't certified, you don't have curriculum, you don't have community support. And um, we, we recently were able to overcome that by working through high school principals. And so it was basically through the principal of one of the local high schools that we were able to partner with the DOE uh, to be able to get Samoan and Ilocano approved as world languages. I should add that um, there are only two schools in the whole United States that offer Samoan for that purpose. Uh, I think we'll be adding a third here in Hawaii uh, fairly uh, soon. Um, I have another question. <laughs> What was the very best way to certify, well, not to certify, to train teachers for that type of classroom? You mean for the public school or for Yeah, for the, public, for the public schools, because we really need to, in Oklahoma at least, have this as a public school program that's offered not only to tribal members but to 
anyone who wants to take one of the languages. Well, I think you'll have the most success if you're able to get teachers that are certified. Um, you can get nation support to kind of push the teacher into position, but um, if you're able to get teachers already certified, it really kind of takes more excuses away from them. But those teachers also, um, if you can, um, obviously, if they have a high fluency rate, you're going to get um, you're going to get a better, you know, potential for a better program. Obviously, uh, there's different levels of um, teaching um, effectiveness, but um, we found that with this immersion program that it there's a high need for teachers, and so a lot of our students, uh, that's why we had a hard time getting a teacher, was because this, a lot of your successful students are really getting hired um, from the university all the way down to daycare level as immersion programs and language programs um, begin and continue to be offered um, both on territory and in, um, and in urban areas. For um, Psalm 1, um, there is no teacher training program uh, in existence anywhere for training teachers to teach the language, even in both American and in independent Samoa. Our program at the University of Hawaii has uh, trained teachers over the past 30 years, basically through um, uh, students doing coursework at the university through perhaps second language studies or education, and then being mentored by faculty uh, at in the Samoan program. And um, that's pretty much what we're doing with this program. Our faculty at the university, with their expertise, are, are mentoring and, and providing teacher training for our teachers in the ANA program. We also have assistance from uh, trained teachers from uh, the Hawaiian language program. And until recently, we had someone from uh, New Zealand helping us as well in, in teacher training and curriculum development. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for your questions, Dessa. We are going to go to John Barbary. John? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I was interested in uh, Mr. Rushani Printup's uh, uh, comments on paying students. And I was wondering if he could expand a little bit on that. Uh, I am curious as to uh, if, if there was a, a set of criteria that was used to select students for the, that program. I know you had a graduating class of seven just recently, but uh, as well, I, I'm curious, is, is the, the objective to develop teachers or just to have more speakers in the community through more concentrated uh, training? Uh, could you expand on that? Uh, yeah. I'll, first of all, um, we have an admissions test. Um, there's actually 61 uh, prefixes in Mohawk. Um, they're like different ways of saying like, I like it, you like it, he likes her, they like them. So there's 61 different ways of, of saying like. Um, they have to know 40 of them, 100% to, to, to pass our admissions test. So they study 40 and they're given a test of 15 to 20 and uh, they have to get 100 on the test. To um, That's the first step. Um, I really our criteria... Um, is, is that we're really looking for, our ideal student would be, uh, and I hate to say this, but you know, youth is on their side when it comes to language acquisition. And, and, and that's not across the board, that's in general. Um, we also um, ideally are looking for um, students that are interested in being teachers. You want your students to be vocal. If they're not vocal in English, they're probably not going to be vocal or talkative in their indigenous language. We also um, want young, young people because if they become fluent, they're the ones most likely to pass it on to their kids. Mm -hmm. And so that's another um, part. It's also uh, encouraging if they're into their traditional teachings because the language is still used a lot in that uh, realm. And we also found that the dedication is, uh, tends to be higher when um, they have that goal as well. And so, um, but the class is we, we pay the students um, a stipend that um, works out to about twelve and a half dollars an hour. It's uh, for thirty hours a week for a thousand eighty hours, and um, it's 
It keeps the students in the class, of course, and the admissions test really kind of weeds out those that don't have at least the aptitude to study those 40 words to get into the class. And so um, it has a very high success rate with students graduating, you know, higher than you would get in traditional college for students entering in and actually um, graduating. But it's a very intense program. It was very quickly. It's amazing how quickly you can learn um, when you're in that environment. And uh, we really modeled it after the Six Nations program. And, and um, you're seeing other programs in the Confederacy um, following suit as they're seeing the success rate with this program. So you said 1,000 to 80 hours. That's, uh, so it, when it starts, it's continuous for how many weeks? We go months? between eight and nine months because they do get some breaks and holidays in there. It, 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 it almost amounts to nine months by the time they're graduated. So it's nine months of really getting 30 hours of language a week for nine months, eight to nine months. Looking at your photograph of your graduating class, uh, you, you said you're trying to recruit younger people. It didn't look like there was very many young people in there. Are you get, getting more for your new class? Well, in that class we had, we it, it was pretty diverse. We had, um, let's see, two 20-year-olds, a 30-year-old, a couple 40, and, and one in their early, in their 50s. Uh, all of them had had quite a bit of, well, the older students have had a lot of language uh, in the background, but um, there were actually three PhD students in that class as well. Um, so it really, uh, it was a successful class. In the next class, um, yeah, they're all they're all in their 20s and 30s in the next class. Okay. Well, when you said young, I, I was thinking more along the lines of you know youth, you know, or children. Well, uh, it's yeah, they can't. You can't get, you know, under 18 when you're doing 30 hours a week for eight to nine months. And there, there is a trade-off if they're really young, like 18 to your 18 to 21 year olds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not as focused. Right. And but, but if you can get them to be, some of our most successful students have come in as like, you know, teenagers and and learned very quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, that looks like it for the questions. I appreciate everybody, you know, hanging in there and staying with us. We went over a little bit uh, um, over what we usually do. I want to uh, let you know that this webinar was recorded and it will be available in about two weeks. Um, you can either use the link that you see on your screen or you can go to the ANA website to the resources tab and type in webinar and it will bring up a list of all of the different webinars that ANA has produced um, over the last few years. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. You did an absolutely wonderful job and we appreciate it very much. Please take care. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Goodbye. Bye now. Goodbye. So fast we flew.